All right. Hi, everyone. How are we doing? Pretty good. All right. I'll take it. Um, so I am really excited to be here today, uh, not only because I'm excited to share a little bit of my story and the really cool things that I've been really lucky to learn along the way, but also because today I want to change the way you think about innovation and about asking questions. So let's start where all great things do with a very simple question. And the slide will pop up with the question, but if you had to sum up who you are in one word for me, what would that one word be? Everyone got it in mind? There's, some of you are looking confused. There's like one girl who looks like downright mad, like, Gee, Shri, you can't like sum up all of this in one word. And the thing is, you're right. But our society is built on careers that are made in one word. You hear doctor, that's one word. If you ask me who I am, I would say I'm a scientist. Him, he's a lawyer. Her, she's an artist. Those kinds of labels are really important for how we see the world. They're really important to how we compartmentalize and get a snapshot of who a person is, what they do, and what they care about. But that's not to say they're, they're not super intimidating. They're, they're really scary to have to label yourself as this one thing. And so today, let's do a little exercise in labeling. How about that? Um, I want you guys to think for a second of a famous scientist. All right, do you guys have it in mind? The people who probably popped in, into your mind are the greats, you know, Da Vinci, Marie Curie, uh, Albert Einstein. These are individuals who revolutionized their fields. They're the people who shaped how we do science today. But in my first sentence, I said a really important word. And I'm not sure if you guys caught it. And that word was individual. And in fact, those are the scientists we know. They're the ones we recognize. They are the, the solitary genius, the, the lone expert in the field who had these brilliant insights and discovered everything we could ever know. But I would argue that innovation in today's era actually doesn't happen like that. In fact, the, the fact that you can reach out to the entire breadth of human knowledge at your fingertips on our smartphones all the time, the fact that you could be spending your time learning anything you wanted to through online courses, that makes the idea of innovating in today's world pretty scary. I mean, it can be paralyzing. And that can be a little bit overwhelming. So how does anyone do it? Let's, let's think about science in today's era. How do people innovate? And to do that, let's, let's take a certain field. I'm an MD-PhD student, so let's pick a field near and dear to my heart, and that would be medicine. So for a second, I want you guys to think about what you think the biggest clinical innovation in the last 30 years has been. Is it a new fancy piece of technology? Is it a new and improved drug? Actually, it's not, neither of those. It's something that seems so obvious, so simple, that you wouldn't even think it's an innovation. So a few years ago, a professor at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Pronovost, uh, recognized that some of his patients were starting to get infections from these IV lines that were put in their arms. Now, this is a problem that's very easily solvable. We know the steps to be able to prevent it. But he was noticing that a ton of people were getting these infections. So as somebody who loved flying planes, he actually noticed that in the aviation industry, the checklists that pilots used right before they took off actually prevented a lot of issues later on. And so he had the insight to say, well, why don't we introduce a checklist into how we do clinical practice? It's that idea applied far wide across hospitals and practices that has prevented tons of medical mistakes. 
It's prevented surgeons from chopping off the wrong limb. It's prevented people from be, being given drugs that they would otherwise be allergic to. Those kinds of innovations are really important, and they come at the intersections of these fields. They come from the geniuses of today's era, people like Dr. Pronovost at Johns Hopkins or Dr. Atul Gawande, who went on to popularize this idea of the checklist. And I would say that's how the biggest innovations are happening in today's world. They're crossovers between the aviation industry and medicine, or it's crossovers between computer science and how we do environmental sciences. Those crossovers are powerful. So what will the geniuses of tomorrow look like? Well, I think they're going to be really interdisciplinary teams. They're going to be groups of people who will come together to see the big problems in one field and how they can be solved by the little solutions of another. And that's what I call the environment of innovation. So what is that? Well, I think an environment of innovation actually looks a lot like this room. I mean, if you turn around to the person that is sitting next to you, it's probably somebody with a very different skill set than you. It's probably somebody who has a completely different background and way of solving problems. As you go out and start to create these careers at the intersections of fields that didn't even exist maybe a hundred years ago, I hope you keep in mind that you can assemble those teams to match the brilliance that you need in every single field. So be the biologist that collaborates with the computer scientists. Be the engineer who talks to the politicians. Be the central conduits between these fields, because that can lead to some really powerful things. And in terms of environments of innovation, I, I've been really lucky, actually. I've been really lucky to experience a lot of these throughout my life. As, as Sky said, I was the winner of the 2011 Google Global Science Fair. Um, and after that, I had the chance to go to Harvard, which is basically a giant environment of innovation, a brilliant minds coming together and people who are really going to go on to change the world. And along the way, I've also had the chance to meet some people who are currently changing our world, which has been exciting. And those opportunities will actually shape the kind of problems that you have the chance to get exposed to. They're going to shape the problems that you get the chance to see. So as a science fair winner, I had the chance to go out and speak to a ton of high school students and see what kinds of issues they were dealing with and what kinds of tools could actually make things a little bit better. And I realized that there was really a lack of engaging and introductory tools to teach kids about technology, which is something that I thought should be solved. And so as a biologist, I went on to co-found this startup which creates engineering kits for kids through using Minecraft as a gaming platform to let you build actual physical hardware. It's really exciting. I've, I've been lucky to really work at these intersections, to see the beautiful ways that medicine and technology and education and gaming, how they can all come together in really powerful ways. And that power is, is really something that I think all of us can share in being a little bit awestruck at. And so today, I want you guys to think about these intersections. I want you to think about the teams you will create, the big problems that you want to solve. I mean, honestly, if you think about it, the most exciting part of the fact that we can come up with solutions to small things is the fact that we have the capability to share it with anyone at the touch of a button. That's exciting. And actually, it's the, the, the power of that sharing actually comes from the anyone. It comes from the masses of people online who can help you solve big problems. In fact, in, in 2008, some scientists at the University of Washington actually used that power in a really interesting way. They were having some trouble actually figuring out the protein structure of a protein involved in HIV AIDS. 
they hadn't been able to solve it for three years. So they created this online game where anyone online could go and play a puzzle to solve different parts of the structure. Want to guess how long it took the mass of online gamers? 10 days. That is innovation. And I think you're going to hear more and more stories of this kind of innovation as you go forward. You're going to hear about creative ways that people use the technology that we have. But you're also going to hear some stories of incredible collaboration. You're going to hear about hundreds of physicists coming together at CERN to use the Large Hadron Collider to be able to probe the questions of our universe. You're going to hear about the engineer who partners with the designer to create the iPhone. These collaborations are really powerful and they're new. For the longest time, we have been taught that, okay, you are going to fit into a box. You are going to fit into your one word. You're going to become a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer. Every single one of those is a box with a path, and the path to get there has been laid out by generations and generations before you. But today, I want you to see that there's a danger in that. There's a danger in being in the box because it stops you from seeing the way things could be better if you're so stuck on the way things are meant to be. So today, here's what I would encourage you to do. Cast your net of interests far and wide and follow anything that you're interested in. Don't pigeonhole yourself. Don't focus to a point where you can't think outside your own one word, outside your own little box. Go ahead and be the engineer who has a passion for politics. Go ahead and be the biologist who dabbles in studying the stars. Go ahead and be the artist who partners to make the new great piece of technology. But next time somebody asks you to sum yourself up in one word, Make sure that word is innovator. Thanks.